Hi, this is Dr. Kenny Handelman with video number three on alternatives for ADD and ADHD. This video is called Alternative Approaches with Research Behind Them. My name is Dr. Kenny Handelman and I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. I'm an expert in ADD and ADHD and I'm board certified in the USA and Canada and I work just outside of Toronto, Canada. My mission is to make sure that you have the right information you need to make the best healthcare decisions you can about ADD and ADHD. And because I've covered that in two other videos, we'll stop there. But if this is your first time seeing me on video number three, please go back and find videos number one and two. Now, when it comes to alternative treatments that have research behind them, there are different kinds of research. Now this is really important for you to realize. The standard or the ideal research design when testing a treatment is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. That means that you test a treatment, let's say supplement A, in a group of people with ADHD and you compare them to a group of people taking a placebo or a fake treatment. And you monitor them over time with a specific measure to see does the supplement A work better than the placebo? And to make sure the study works well, you have to make sure that the doctors don't know who's getting the placebo or the supplement, and that the people don't know which one they're getting, and then you can measure it without bias and find out if the treatment actually works. Now that's the ideal study design. Part of the issue with alternative treatments is many of them are not well suited to work when it comes to that ideal study design. So something like homeopathy, for example, which does have a couple of studies published on it with respect to ADHD, homeopathy is very hard to do a study on because of the fact that it is treatment that has to be individualized. Meaning you can't just say everybody gets supplement A or placebo because the doctor or the, the practitioner has to get to know each person individually and create a remedy plan for that individual. Well, this just kind of kills the ideal study design. So there are different types of research and that has an impact on the research available for alternative treatments. Most doctors consider the fact that if there's no randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, then the treatment isn't considered to be well-researched and proven. That said, most of the alternative treatments do not have that research base, but they do have other studies. And if we look at those studies critically and review them and understand them, we can get some guidance about how to use different alternative treatments safely and effectively. So one of the treatments is diet change. There's been a lot of speculation about diet and diet's impact in ADD and ADHD. In fact, there's a, a diet called the Feingold diet, which has been a, out for about three decades at this point. And essentially, there are different variations of diets. Essentially, what they do is they cut out the food additives and preservatives, refined sugars. Sometimes they cut out things like milk or gluten or other sorts of things like that. And for some individuals, this has an impact. Now, there have been a couple of really good studies published in the past couple of years that have looked at the fact that food preservatives and additives may increase hyperactivity and inattention in kids who do not have ADHD. So that's something that suggests that if we cut out food additives in people who have ADHD, that it may improve them. But I have to be clear, that was not proven in the research. Secondly, there was a study that looked out of Europe that looked at a few foods diet. They did it sort of an elimination diet where people were only on 14 foods and those foods were quite pure and wholesome. And they found that a high percentage of kids with ADHD actually improved significantly. So there is some growing research that diet changes may have an impact in ADD or ADHD. Now I'll tell you, as a doctor who works with families, with kids and teens with ADHD, if you want to do diet change, it's often easier if you start before the kid is eight years old. And this isn't because of brain development or anything, it's truly practical. Because if you have to get a kid who's 12 or 14 to avoid sugar and chips and sodas and everything else, it can be very hard. When a child is younger, you have more direct impact on what they eat in their diet. So 
that just think about that when it comes to diet change. Omega-3 fatty acids or the fish oils. There's more and more research being done that shows that omega-3 fatty acids are quite helpful for ADHD, for learning disabilities, mood disorders, as well as potentially some physical issues, things like heart disease and arthritis. The omega-3 fatty acids cross in through the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain and they seem to work well to help to support our nerve cells communicating one to the other. Our brains are 60% fat and we need to have the right balance of omega-3s versus omega-6s and most western diets have way too much omega-6s. So it's thought that that's a little bit of a stress on people who have ADHD learning issues or mood disorders so if we can supp supplement the omega-3 fatty acids then we can improve brain functioning hopefully now if you take omega-3 fatty acids it doesn't have the same effect as a medicine and it doesn't work within days or weeks it's more like weeks or months but it's certainly worth adding and the side effects are quite low neurofeedback this is looking at brain waves our brains run on electricity there's electricity in our brains and when we're paying attention well we are in beta brain waves right and hopefully you're in beta right now listening to me quite attentively when we start to daydream we go to alpha brain waves and part of what researchers find is people with ADHD and ADD spend more time daydreaming in alpha throughout the day so neurofeedback is a process where people go into an office and put electrodes on their head connected to a computer they do tasks and when their brain waves hit beta like where they're supposed to be to concentrate it actually starts to uh, reward them and so that gradually over a number of sessions they start to concentrate better now this is a treatment that takes a fair bit of time and there's often a fair bit of cost involved you'd need to research that in your insurance and everything else but there's growing research that neurofeedback can be helpful for ADD and ADHD working memory training this is a really interesting one it's a software training program that helps individuals with ADHD to improve their executive functioning particularly working memory this means that people will problem solve better control impulses better and hopefully have fewer symptoms of ADHD and working memory training has growing research which is very impressive that can help with ADHD and I consider it an alternative treatment uh, though I'm hopeful it will actually become more mainstream and, and widely accepted because the research is very good for it so those are essentially uh, a few of the eight alternative treatments that I've reviewed the research for in this new CD program that's coming out now to learn more about it go to alternativesforadhd.com I hope you found these videos helpful my goal was to provide you with some information to get you started to learn about alternatives for ADD and ADHD. If you found these helpful and you'd like to learn more, these CDs contain well over two hours of information of me sharing about the research done, the background and framework about ADD and ADHD, and the alternative treatments, and how to talk to your doctor to pull these treatments together as part of a comprehensive treatment plan. So if you're interested, go to alternativesforadhd.com. And thanks for watching. My name's Dr. Kenny Handelman. Bye-bye.